Ariel, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited. I saw your email come across our inbox and I thought we had to talk to you because it looks like you are taking a different approach to business. So I really want to start off the conversation just by sharing with our audience who you are and what you do. So tell us, tell us all about it. (laughs) Okay. Well, I actually have a really interesting background, I'd probably say. Um, So I guess it kind of started, you know, I graduated from NYU for college and um, I got into the real world and started adulting. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is what regular people do. They sit in offices and they work for four years. And um, and even if they're not 100% happy, like they just try to make it work. And it just did not sit well with my spirit. And so from that point, I really started kind of my, my own journey that was already kind of in motion from college um, to start figuring out like, okay, what's actually going to make me happy? Um, and what's going to make me feel free and alive? And so I quit my job in New York. Uh, I was working in marketing. I've always worked in marketing pretty much um, other than kind of a brief stint in journalism, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and I left and I moved to Brazil without speaking any Portuguese, never had been like just had it in my heart and I was like there's something about this place that has something for me and so I'm just gonna go and figure out exactly what it was everyone thought I was crazy like and even when I quit my job I had no idea how I was gonna get to Brazil I just started telling people and then like literally that whole like law of attraction started to like come into play because I was telling people I was moving to Brazil people were congratulating me and they were like oh my gosh (laughs) and I'm still like I don't have a plane ticket I have no idea how I'm gonna afford this but everything totally like fell into place and so in the process um, I had also begun um, writing about sexuality probably for maybe six months prior and um, I was one of the few kind of women online who were writing about sex without using a um, alias basically and so I was very active on social this is kind of you know back before it was like super popular to kind of be like you know on social Twitter was still very early Facebook was still very early Um, and so I was really just kind of on there burying my soul talking about my experience you know um, you know basically coming into my own power as a woman and so I continued that writing um, in when I got to Brazil. And then after that, I started a magazine called Corset. And the magazine was completely committed to empowering women sexually. Beautiful, beautiful project. Um, it's still up, you know, at corsetmagazine.com. But it completely inspired me because I was connecting with so many women uh, who were just ready to have a safe space to tell their own sexual empowerment stories. And so fast forward, um, basically, I ended up coming back to the U.S. eventually and um, getting back into marketing. Um, I started my own marketing agency. I live in Miami now. And I finally reached the point where I was like, I'm ready to bridge these two worlds. Like, I'm tired of having this kind of one side that knows all about, you know, who I am and what I believe in terms of, you know, sexually liberated women. And then this other side that's kind of more... Um, buttoned up, right? Where I am not necessarily hiding it, but, you know, it's like, oh, she's like this Harvard trained business strategist. And, you know, she's this super badass in terms of business. But it's like, then when like, they get in like a room with me, I'm like, listen, this is what it actually takes, like in terms of your own personal development to get you to the level that you want to be at in your business. And it's not all about traditional business tactics. So that's kind of my creative journey in a kind of long-winded way. But yeah, that's how this all got started. No, there is so much that we can dig into there. So I really want to start with what have the traditional tactics been whenever it comes to business development? And especially for women, how have those traditional tactics failed us? Yeah, so it's very, I think, straight line, right? So they tell you, okay, if you're going to uh, succeed in business, you know, especially like in the online world, which is a lot of what my agency specializes in, it's like, all right, you have to have a website and it has to be set up like this. Your opt-in has to be there. Um, Your funnel needs to look like this. Um, Your social presence needs to be like this, you know, and all of these things kind of come into play in terms of how, you know, we as women should be like setting up our businesses and running our businesses. And there is a lot of truth, you know, in, you know, those, those theories and those strategies, they've been tested, you know, they've worked for some women, they've um, not worked for others. But I think 
the difference is, is that you can have all of the tools and information in front of you, but if you haven't developed the confidence and the intuition um, and the personal power to know like when to use those tools, because it's not a science, um, you're not going to probably see the growth that you're looking to see. And what I found was since sexuality is such a topic that's still so taboo kind of, and it's a bit uncomfortable comfortable for a lot of women, if I can get them to dig into the most kind of uncomfortable part of themselves and master that, then all of a sudden they just completely blow up and bloom as CEOs and entrepreneurs. And so that's what really lights me up. And that's what I recommend. I have totally seen this even amongst our clubhouse members or the people that Kathleen and I work with. Specifically, I remember being at our Chattanooga retreat for the clubhouse and all of these like amazing entrepreneur women sitting around a table and we were all talking about how we identify ourselves and no one was saying business owner or CEO. They were all like, you know, I'm a coach or I'm a maker or I'm a, a hand letter or illustrator or whatever it was. But everyone was having such a hard time claiming and like feeling confident and saying I'm a business owner or I'm a CEO or whatever that is. And it's something that I see over and over and makes me really sad and makes me really want to fix it because it is all based on confidence, on having the confidence to say, I am so good at what I do in terms of my skill that I've also developed an entrepreneurial um, skill set or business owning skill set that supports it. And I think, I think there's so much power there in people. People claiming that confidence, cultivating it, and then claiming it, um, and putting themselves in that powerful position. Yeah, I'm really a big proponent of women owning like the title CEO because at the end of the day, if it's your company, that's um, what you are, you know. And I think that that confidence comes from again, like really understanding who you are, like, and how much power you just have, like, as a woman. And particularly, like, when we're talking about sexuality, I mean, we're talking about sexual energy, right? So sexual energy is the foundation of creative energy. And so all things are birthed from sexual energy, regardless of whether we're making another human being, um, or if we're just, you know, birthing something into existence. And for me, it's like, if you can start to master your sexual energy, and it's not just something that uh, you have to uh, have sex to actually do, um, but just getting like more familiar with some of the more pleasurable and intimate parts of yourselves, um, that's what I think is gonna get you to the point where if you master that, like you're definitely gonna be able to walk into the room and feel a lot better, I think, about who you are, the power that you have, and like owning that CEO title for sure. I want to get into that and some of that, like what it takes to really master your own energy and sexual energy and how that ties into business. But I wanted to share really quick that whenever I was pregnant um, with my son, which was what, four years ago, he's three and a half now. I felt like everything around me was so abundant and everything was growing and specifically my business. And I was shocked because I have been taught for so long, you know, just through society or example or whatever, that once you're a pregnant woman, you are out of commission. Like you are done. You are now a mom and that's pretty much going to be it. And I didn't even know if I was going to continue working, but the universe had something else in store for me. And the fact that I was able to build my business more than ever while I was pregnant. And I really did for the first time ever feel that tie to creativity on a grander scale. You guys, I didn't get pregnant by myself. Like there was some getting it on that happened to make that happen. Right. So I do think that, you know, that was the most obvious tie that I had to it, but I'm curious to hear where you've seen women who have mastered that energy be able to bring it to their businesses or like, you know, do you have any case studies? Like what has happened for women that you've worked with? Yeah. So I think I'll put it this way. I like to think of the kind of mastering as an experiment. Right. And so, um, it was really interesting because I was, as I was putting together the framework for what is now known as the driven workshops, which is the, the speaking engagements and the workshops that I do around the country. Um, I, 
started to think about, okay, you know, I personally used a lot of these strategies, but I don't want to put this like stamp of guarantee that this is going to work for every single woman. And so for me, it felt so much better to be like, hey, this is work for me. Try it and see, see how it feels. Observe it like it's an experiment. And I think it takes a lot of the pressure off because I, when I look at um, a lot of the conversations more in the sexuality world, I do think it's more like self-help, how to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's cool. But I think it can be very intimidating for a lot of women who are like, okay, so like I'm supposed to go to this like tantra retreat. And I'm supposed to, you know, swing from this bar and like, you know, master my sexual energy. And it's like, okay, that's a lot. <laughs> a, a, a step by step for like harnessing your sexual energy does not sound enticing to me in the least. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, you know. And even for me, as someone who was like in that world running a magazine. I was like, okay, this is interesting. But the most interesting thing for me is when all of the stories, like the personal stories come together and women get in a room, especially in person. And we just kind of share what has worked for us and we're given the space to, to have conversations. So in terms of case studies though, to answer your question, I would say that the best case studies actually come from um, just the women who are, who are closest to me. Um, and so, Oftentimes I'll get in a room with like some of my best girlfriends, right? Um, and we'll talk about how our businesses are doing and we'll also talk about how our sex lives are going, right? And it's always interesting when we're having like really great sex or we're really tapped into our pleasure, all of a sudden like our, our, our businesses, our money, like everything is just like heightened. <laughs> And when we're going through a dry spell and we're not taking care of that pleasure and we're not cater catering to ourselves, all of a sudden it's like, oh, what's going on? Like my business is kind of flatlining. And so I think, you know, it can happen in many, you know, different ways. Like actually sex with a partner is one example. But I remember when I was in Brazil, I was, you know, experimenting with a variety of different ways to play with my sexual energy. Sometimes it was literally just going to the beach in a damn near nothing, you know, bikini and letting the sun like hit my skin and have this really sensual experience in the ocean. Other times it'd be I'm wearing a yoni egg, you know, and I'm working with my rose quartz or my obsidian and just watching how it like affects everybody around me. And I have a funny story about that that I can tell later, but it's, it's things like that. Wait, that I, no, tell it now. Like, what happened? Okay. So I was in this like really little town in Brazil, right? And I was staying at this really, really small bed and breakfast. And <laughs> the innkeeper was a bit of an asshole, if I'm being completely honest. And he just wasn't a nice guy. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to be here for a few days. Like, I don't know what's up with this dude, but I don't like his attitude. And it'd be nice if he could just be nicer. Because he was just like really irritable, right? And so I started working with my obsidian egg. So I put my obsidian egg and it's known for blocking negative energy. Okay, explain to our listeners what a yoni egg is and what obsidian does. Yeah, okay. So a yoni egg is a crystal egg that you can use basically for a couple of reasons. Um, in ancient cultures, it's been used to strengthen your vaginal walls. Uh, and so it can help with um, you know, preparing yourself if you do want to go down the, the route of childbirth. It can be helpful just in terms of uh, tightening um, your, your vagina for sex. Uh, and it's just good for like health as well. Like, so you don't deal, deal with like prolapse and things like that. And so um, the other way it's used is to work with different crystal properties and to bring that specific crystals energy into your womb space, which allows you to manifest it, you know, kind of into the real world, right? And so I was working with an obsidian egg and an obsidian, uh, black obsidian in particular, is known for warding off like negative energy, right? So this guy's being really mean to me, like really mean to me before I put the egg in. I put the egg in, I go to sleep, I wake up and I go to breakfast and it was like complete 180. I thought I was talking to a brand new person or like his twin. He's so nice. He's cooking me breakfast for free. He's like, tell me more about yourself. Like, where are you from, like, et cetera, et cetera. And then he tells me his whole life story and how he ended up being an innkeeper, et cetera. And we became like best friends, like in the week that followed. And I just was like, you know what? Again, as an experiment, it worked, <laughs> it worked. And so Yoni eggs for me, like, are always just a fun way uh, that I also talk to, uh, I give to women to kind of try out. Um, I usually get my Yoni eggs from yoniegs.com with Tiffany Janae. Um, but it's, 
yeah, great, 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 great way to experiment if you have someone at the office, like, who is just being a complete butt face, or, um, you know, maybe you want to see how your partner reacts, like, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of information about Yoni Eggs, especially on the site that I just gave, but yeah, really, really fun. Great way to, to experiment and to, to work that energy. I want a Yoni Egg now. <laughs> Well, what's so funny is boss vacation. No one's gonna know. Is, I'm but totally I remembering a great aunt right now who had one like sitting out as like a decorative piece. And wait, are you sure it wasn't like one of those? What are they? Faberge egg? It was not. It was rose quartz. I have very like vivid memory of this, and my childhood just my childhood just changed, maybe <laughs> drastically. <laughs> It's fine. Okay. <laughs> so I want to I wanna talk about a few more experiments, but I want to talk a little bit about pleasure because you were even talking about the sun hitting your skin. And I think that there's this aspect of sensuality that really deals with your senses, right? So things that you're tasting and smelling and touching. And I feel like there is such a disconnect between pleasure and business. Like we are taught so hard. And even in some of the language that Emily and I use that you got to grind it out. You got to hustle and we love a grind and we love a hustle and that can feel very pleasurable, but there is kind of this disconnect there, right? On a grander scheme that you've got to pay your dues and that it's got to be hard. So is there more place for pleasure in the workplace? And how do we really make that happen aside from maybe wearing a yoni egg to a podcast recording. <laughs> so I personally feel like um, you have to grind in the right direction, What right? Like, and so to grind in the right direction, you have to be tapped into your intuition and pleasure is a link to intuition. Like that's how you know. When it feels good, when your senses are alive, that's how you know you're on the right track. And so for me, um, when it comes to sensuality, I don't know if the American workplace has created a space uh, for that type of expression to be in the office in a really safe way. Um, so I think that, you know, different models will allow for different things. I think if I were thinking about like, how could we rework that? I think just like you have a therapist, you know, in the office, I personally feel like, you know, conversations about sex, um, you know, on a more one-to-one -one thing in terms of like, how is your overall well-being? If you want to have that conversation, you know, there should be a space for you to be able to do that. Or just personally in your own life, just take the precautions to, to have that, that person, you know, whether it's on a professional basis or a coach or, you know, whatever, to, to be able to make sure that you're tapped into that energy. And so um, sensuality um, actually really is the first step, I think, to having more pleasure in your life and like really great sex. Because if you can like wake up your senses to even just the slightest touch, everything is going to be heightened when you have that type of like really powerful energetic exchange between you and another human being. So it's important. Um, and, and I definitely think that um, obviously it plays a, a huge role in, in our careers and in our work. I see such a parallel there between even the book Kathleen and I have just written and <laughs> will be coming out in nine months from now. Um, or so, oh, look, we'll birth it in nine months, Kathleen. <laughs> right. Isn't that sweet? I love that. Um, there's such a parallel between everything that we are always talking in Being Boss in terms of being so mindful about what it is that you're creating so you can make sure you're grinding in the right direction, basically. And I definitely see this point of getting in touch with your sensuality, a place where you're probably trying to be the most mindful of all in order to help you carry that throughout all the other hustle and grinding that you're doing. Um, for sure, I definitely see, see that as a great beginning point for people who are struggling with tapping into what it is they really want to feel all day long um, in terms of what it is that they're working for and how it is that they're grinding it all out. Um, I definitely see it coming from that point of the place or the time in your life when you are trying to be the most connected to yourself and vulnerable and mindful, um, being the place that helps you carry that through. Absolutely. And frankly, like when your senses are alive, you're living a very pleasurable, orgasmic life. 
your anger goes down. And so, you know, even just from a people to people aspect of like having a group of people working on a project, it's like, we want everyone to be at their happiest, most alive, tapped in intuitive, intuitive selves. And so for me, when I think about like interpersonal like dynamics, right? Um, have you ever noticed that when you're angry at someone, um, you're immediately like, don't touch me. Like, just don't touch me. But like, if you actually forced yourself to sit down and after you got over your, your, your anger, of course, right? And like, even if you just held that person's hands and had a face-to-face -face conversation, they teach this in Tantra, your anger level automatically drops because that, that connection, that skin-to-skin -skin connection, it connects your senses. And so it starts to open up a clearer path for communication. And so I think just looking at examples like that, I'm not saying everyone goes into the office and like, let's hold hands. But Kathleen, like, I'm holding your hand the next time I see you. I know, right? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's interesting though, how, you know, again, like sensual touch just in general, like really helps us um, when it comes to, um, you know, the way that we communicate with people. And so again, if you kind of create opportunities for yourself, especially in your more personal spaces outside of the workplace, um, to be more tapped into that energy and then just carry the actual energy, maybe not necessarily the practice, into the workplace. I think you're gonna see a difference in, in the way that people react to you um, and then the types of things that you manifest you know, in your career and in your job. You know, it's interesting that you say this. I think that having a toddler has really, it's touchy. Do you have any kids, Ariel? I don't. I That's don't. okay. It's just like one of those <laughs> things. So, I mean, Emily, I don't know how much of a cuddler your kid is, but my baby is a cuddler. Like we are just constantly all up on each other. And I found that one of the things that is really helpful whenever he gets really upset, like we're talking tantrums and the threes is if we'll touch tummies. So like he could be in the middle of a total fit and I'm like, let's touch tummies. And it's kind of goes back from those days, like the, the moment he was born where they put a baby on your naked body for an hour to help regulate temperature and to regulate breath. And I think that the same thing still applies. There's going to be an age in which I can no longer say let's touch tummies to calm him down. <laughs> but it really bringing that vibe to you know, maybe even some of the conflicts that I have with my husband. And then how do I bring that energy to conflicts at the workplace and not saying that. You Kathleen, know, if you ever tell me let's touch tummies, <laughs> I think we then might need to call up Autumn and amend our, our partnership agreement. <laughs> think about this. Think about this though. Your tummy is this sign of like submission, right? Like whenever a cat is really comfortable with you they're showing you their belly so i really i never put this together until now so it really is that vibe of i'm not literally going to lift up my shirt and show you my belly but how can i be vulnerable in this way that is like exposing of the underside where you could just stab me and kill me <laughs> <laughs> and really making it available to be, I don't know, productive or vulnerable or to, you know, de-escalate situations. I don't know. You're giving me a lot to think about, Ariel. Yeah. Again, it's all a big experiment, I think, you know, because it's like not everything's going to work for every woman. But honestly, like that tip about tummy touching, I'm like, when I do have kids, I'm saving that one because that sounds awesome. <laughs> it's so good. And maybe he's right. just thrown off. He's like, you want to do what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> then he forgets about what he, he forgets about. Love it. But you know, it's funny because even on this podcast, we've talked a lot about, we're constantly getting questions about what do you do whenever you're stressed out? How do you de-stress? And I'll make jokes about getting off, like give yourself an orgasm. And I even had a listener send me <laughs> stuff in the mail. I mean, like, it's just kind of funny. And I'm not trying to be... Um, provocative and I'm not trying to be, I don't know, shocking, but everybody's happier whenever they're having orgasms, right? No, really. It's just, it's true, right? And, it, and you, you almost like you're, you pause to say it because you don't want to sound like sexist or like, you know, whatever, like, oh, like, you know, the big saying is like a well effed women, woman is like, you know, like just so much better to be around, right? And it's like, Oftentimes when I see those articles, like, yeah, okay, I do slightly roll my eyes, but at the same time, I'm like, oh my God, but it's so true, right? Because I personally feel like when a woman's not tapped into her sensual, you know, energy, she's not receiving pleasure on the regular, 
I feel it. I do, you know, and it doesn't mean that she has to be having sex again, but it's like, if she's completely closed off from that energy and she's not cultivating that in her life, um, she walks just differently. It's, it's, it's a different energy that she has to herself. And so it doesn't mean that you have to be this like, um, you know, crazy tantric, like electric woman, but it, it is just being intentional, thinking more about like, okay, like how can I bring more pleasure into my life? I was um, reading a blog post um, specifically, I think it was by Mama Gina, actually. And she was saying, instead of taking a, a shower every morning, take a bath. And she's like, for most people, you think oh, a bath takes so long, et cetera. But when people actually try it, um, and I think it was actually, was it, it might have been Kate Northrop who did a blog post as well, who, who tried it. And she was like, actually, it only took me like 10 more minutes. <laughs> and it's like, oh, but like the difference it makes to just start the day in soak or in the evening soak, you know, give yourself those extra 10 minutes. Like for me, I think that's a lot more appealing to a lot of women than like, you know, potentially meditating or something else that might not be so direct in terms of the senses. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. You know, meditation has gotten a really, um, it's become a part of our mainstream culture and we can easily talk about meditation without shame and without embarrassment. And people are saying you need to meditate like you brush your teeth and maybe we need to be getting off like we brush our teeth, right? And I, if it's, I think so. I think you need to orgasm. Yeah. Here's <laughs> the thing is that I think that it's kind of, um, because it's not something that is the most comfortable thing to talk about, even on a podcast right now. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are our dear listeners going to think? But I it's hope so, so many of you are sitting there squirming in your seats right now, just a little bit, but excited <laughs> and want to go like be a better self-fulfilled perhaps woman and business owner. Do it. And I mean, I have to admit as like, you know, as much as I do joke and I'm being serious about like, if you're stressed, just get it on with yourself. You don't even have to have a partner, get it on with yourself. And I joke about it, but I am a little, you know, shy about, I'm not a sex columnist. Let's just put it that way. Right. No, but I will also say like, it doesn't even have to be sex. Like the thing that I tap into the most, whenever I'm wanting to feel like a badass empowered woman is putting on my red lipstick, exactly. strapping on my heels and walking out the house and really trying hard not to fall for sure. But there is something, there is something so invigorating and freeing about just I don't know, just doing it for the pleasure of doing it, whatever it may be. And for me, it's usually a nice pair of heels and some red lipstick blowing out my hair. Um, or, or like also planning the shit out of something, which if you really want to get super mundane, like tapping into the thing that you know that you are great at mm. and feeling the power and pleasure of doing that thing um, and not feeling ashamed about it. I mean, so often I'll hear really awesome creative people making excuses for their art or whatever it may be, because they're choosing to feel a little bit of shame about doing something they see as frivolous, um, then finding the power in being creative. And I think there's such a shame in that um, when you are choosing the negative of the two options that you have. Agreed, 100%. I want to talk a little bit about how about how this mindset is so frowned upon. I think in so many cultures still, obviously like I'm all down for it. And I know I'm hoping all of our awesome open-minded listeners are still listening and getting excited about all of these things. But, um, but it's still pretty frowned upon for people to walk up in their office with their heels and their red lipstick on in some places. And in some cases, what sort of experiences have you had with butting up against um, the societal norm of women being sexy and smart? You know what? Um, it's, it's definitely, um, I think, something that all women deal with, especially when they're not working for themselves, uh, you know, and you are actually going into an office, right? And so you're trying to be mindful in terms of the way that you're presenting yourself and the energy that you're putting out because you don't want to attract, um, you know, unwanted, you know, advances, right? So you're taking that onus onto yourself, you know, instead of allowing that person to be responsible for their shit. And so for me, I think, you know, it's, 
it's something that the woman has to, I think, ease into and decide where she's comfortable. Um, I know personally, you know, it might not even be like, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge person. It's like, oh, like, I'm going to rock this like mini skirt and like roll up in the office. Like what? You know, like, I'm not going to do that. You know, but what I will say is, you know, I used to have this like huge afro. Now I have like really like, you know, tamed like um, short hair because I don't like doing hair. But um, I used to have this huge afro right when I graduated from college and my father would be like, oh my gosh, like you are not about to go interview for that job with your full afro out. And I'm like, yes, the fuck I am. I'm totally going to go do that. And my feeling was, well, either they're going to hire me because I'm, I have, you know, I'm me and I'm amazing. You know, I'm great at what I do. And I also just freely want to be able to express myself or they're not. <laughs> and if they're not, you know, whatever. And the same thing I used to, you know, I had my, um, uh, a lot of the positions that I held as a journalist where I often was writing about sex or um, before I actually created my own marketing agency a few years ago, you know, when I'd apply to jobs, I'd have my sex magazine on my resume. And again, my father would say to me, you need to take that off your, your resume. I know that you accomplished like some really great things in running your magazine. And it was a, you know, a solid business, but he's like, you're going to freak people out. And I'm like, no, I was like, either they're going to dig it, you know, and they're going to understand who I am and the way that I've been able to build my career as a marketer and that I can play in different industries and different spaces, or they're going to be freaked out and tell me to go. And the funny thing is, every time I had an interview, the one thing they wanted to talk about was like the magazine. They were like, wait, so we saw your magazine. We love your magazine. Tell us more about this magazine. And they were like so excited, right? And like my magazine is not for the faint of heart, right? So it's like, if you, even if you go to the website, you're going to see like beautiful, you know, nude like pictures. You're gonna see, you know, for our vagina and vulvas issue, like an actual vagina on the cover. So it's not something that's very like understated. Um, and a lot of people even would push back on that. They're like, well, wow, Ariel, like you really had to put like a, a vagina on the cover and I'm like, yeah, like, because it's the vulva and vagina's issue. Like, I'm not going to sit here and, and make it something, you know, that's more muted to make people call. Like, like, I don't know. So anyway, I just find that it's best to take it at the, um, I guess, the stages that you feel comfortable with. You know, I'm more the person who's like, you know, F it, let's jump in the deep end. You know, if you're the person who's like, I kind of just want to crawl a little bit, maybe I just put the red lipstick on, or maybe I just wear this flowy dress that makes me feel more like a queen today. Take it at the step that, that you want to take it at um, and just give yourself permission to express. Right. I think I, that there's, oh. I love your mindset around putting the thing on your resume or showing up with your glorious Afro and being who you are. And this just goes to, goes to color in more deeply, um, how Kathleen and I are always talking about just be who you are and show up as you are, because that will attract the people to you who are for you and repel the ones who are not, because you were saying like, either they'll get it and they'll want me or they won't. In which case, if they don't, then these are not the kinds of people that you want to be hanging out with 40 hours a week by any means. Exactly. And I think that this, you know, goes into what I was thinking about where if they don't, it's because they're scared. And what are people so afraid of whenever it comes to women owning their power? Yeah. Amen. And, <laughs> and letting people deal with their fear. Like their fear is not my responsibility to regulate, you know? And so- Yes. In my business, honestly, you know, oftentimes, you know, I'm putting together campaigns for clients and they're like, you know, and I'm working through copy and, you know, we're scheduling things and they're like, oh, like, oh, I don't know, Ariel, that email kind of pushes the edge. And I'm like, you know, like, this is your, this is how you talk in real life. Like, this is your voice. This is what you believe, you know? So why would we dumb this down? Like, do you really want that, that customer who is, you know, X, Y, and Z? Like, you don't at the end of the day. So don't be afraid to, to express yourself in whatever that actually looks like, you know, and I think it's valid for entrepreneurs as well as people who are, you know, just working nine to fives. And I think that can be a huge differentiating factor is that people hire people. So the more human you can be in your business and how you show up and how you send an email, sometimes, you know, on a kind of different level, I will even... Okay. So for example, Emily and I were going through all of our book edits the other day and it was like the copy edited version with all this markup in it. And it's very, 
I kind of cut and dry and kind of serious. And there were some things that we would say, we're leaving this because we're boss ass bitches, you know, or like we might yeah. say that in the comment back to the copy editor, like to say like, this is the vibe we're getting across and really treating the copy editor like a human too. Like she might think that this comment back at her is funny. So I wasn't trying to make it so transactional. I was trying to bring some humanness back to it. And I think that's something that we could all benefit from a little bit more from how we write our emails to how we show up how we dress to work. Like the fact that there's even in an HR handbook, something that might say how you have to wear your hair or how you have to wear your clothes blows my mind. And so Emily and I, whenever we're working with creative entrepreneurs, one of the things we do is have them write their own handbook. Like if you had to write your own employee handbook, what is in it? What is the dress code? And maybe your dress code is show up like a boss, whatever that means for you. And if on one day it's black lipstick, so be it. If on the next day it's fishnets, so be it. Whatever it is for you, that's how you should show up. I love it. Absolutely love it. Totally cosign. <laughs> okay. So, um, I want to come back to the experiments. Are there a few more that you could share with us that our listeners could start trying to own their sensuality and to own their confidence or to even boost their confidence in work and life? So I'll actually um, give you a more, um, I guess you could say, quote unquote, like tame one, right? So we have, we have the fun yoni eggs, right? So everyone, you know, go, go try and get your yoni eggs. Um, maybe practice at home before you, you venture out. <laughs> yeah, because like, am I going to be walking down the sidewalk and then a crisp okay. is going to come falling? Oh, right? It's like, it's, it's the perpetual kegel. Like I'm, you're just holding it. I'm not going <laughs> to sit here and act like it's never happened to me before because yes, it totally has happened to me before and it totally popped out and I was like, Oh, shit. But it was it was great. I totally just played it off like it's not That's awesome. like so I have I've had this moment a couple of times like just keeping crystals in my bra for other woo woo reasons. Um, like going into a dressing room and like taking my <laughs> taking my bra off and <laughs> crystals hitting the floor. <laughs> totally have had that happen on a couple of occasions. Um, the yoni egg is a whole other thing. Yeah, <laughs> and there's there's some pretty funny stories out there about you know, yoni eggs that have popped out, you know, and, but the more you work with the egg, like, even if you just say this weekend, I'm going to work with the egg, I'm primarily going to be home, you know, whatever, like the easier it will be for you to like, it just won't come out. Like now, like this is probably like TMI for too many people. Like I can use the bathroom. It won't come out. Like it's, I've, I've gotten to that point. That is some yeah. mad multi, like, what is it? A multitasking skill multi you have there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, like, takes practice, but I, I do believe that anyone can get there. So, okay. So there's the crazy kind of fun uh, side. And then there is just specifically working with that energy, right? And so I am a Kundalini yoga instructor. I love Kundalini yoga. It completely will light your root chakra and your second chakra, which is basically like your, you know, bottom, like nether area like on fire like you want to talk about being able to walk with like that that it's just this energy that you're going to have when you walk into a room like definitely practice some kundalini yoga and so um this probably crosses more into what people would imagine as meditation but it's all the same you know really energy work right and so um kundalini yogis we have this practice called sadhana basically you wake up um and from 4 a.m to more or less 6 30 a.m you pray and you meditate and you do yoga, right, for two and a half hours. And the idea being that if you start your day and you dedicate 10% of your day to uh, working with that energy, you're going to live, you know, a better life. And so um, this practice is called sadhana. And you can do it, you know, just once. Um, you can do it for 40 days. You can do it for 90 days. You can do it for 120 days. And then you can do it for like a thousand days, right? And so I actually started my year this year doing it for um, 90 days. So it's, and the days are consecutive. So, I mean, like I said, you could do it for one day if you want to, but it's like, it's not, oh, I'm gonna do 90 days. I'm gonna do it when I feel like it. it's like, no, you do it consecutively to build energy. So I did it for 90 days. For 90 days, I woke up basically at like 3.30 in the morning. I went into my Kundalini Yoga community here in Miami. Shout out to Kundalini Yoga Miami. And I literally 
did this practice for two and a half hours for 90 days for the first three months of the year. And you want to talk about being on fire. Like it was, uh, it, it allowed me to tap into my like sexual energy in a way that I had never tapped into it before. It was from a much more grounded place. So it was, it was less about like, okay, let me go like, you know, grab my vibrator and like get off like to, you know, which is cool. Like, you know, everyone has their, their, their thing, you know, but for me, it actually kind of calmed my, my sex drive in a really powerful way. And it gave me the, the, like a deeper energy, like in, in that womb space. And it allowed me really to be able to manifest things that, you know, were amazing, you know, both in my business, um, uh, just in life, you know, uh, relationship wise, like everything. And so I always recommend it as something for people to try. If you have a Kundalini yoga center near you, like even if you just go in for a class, you're like, okay, Ariel, like 4 a.m. is like really intense. But just doing, I think, Kundalini yoga in general, and it's something that I also teach in my driven workshops, like it's, it's totally a great way to start activating that energy for sure. Have you ever done any Kundalini, Emily? I've never done it. No. I have some friends that have done it and have gone for their, I wonder if it was the 120 days or the thousand days. I remember it seeming like a really long time <laughs> doing the sadhana. I didn't make it for 120 days. Like it was so funny. All my Kundalini friends, cause I, I, you know, I fell into it, honestly. Um, and they were like, so like, you know, do you want to, you know, we do this practice and you want to do this practice. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> like, I was like, okay, you know, in my mind, I'm like, oh, it's just another like 90 day challenge. Like, why not? And I'm 4 a.m. Like, is not just another 90 day challenge. <laughs> oh man. You know, but the great thing is that you, the expectation, you know, when you go to Sadhana, at least in Miami, I can't speak for every single Kundalini center, but the expectation when you're doing your 90 days or your 120 days is not that you come and you sit up every day the expectation is that you show up and that even if you sleep the entire time, because I had days like that where I literally would get up, roll my mat, lay down and sleep for this two and a half hours. But the energy of everyone doing the yoga, chanting, you know, the music, et cetera, the sleep that you get is so elevated that you're still getting the energy regardless of whether you're actively pursuing it or if you're more in a sleep kind of subconscious state. So I still recommend for people to go. Uh, that sounds I fascinating. That. I'm going to Google it later. I have done some yoga nidra. Do you ever do any of that? I haven't. Okay. So it's like a relaxation technique. We'll be sure to link to that in the show notes as well. We're going to link to all of these things in the show notes. Um, but it's really just isolating one small body point at a time and then relaxing. And it's kind of like a, you can do a 20 minute guided meditation or a 40 minute guided meditation, but it's like what you're talking about where it's, even if you fall asleep, you wake up feeling different. Like it is a, just a deep relaxation. Um, is there anything else that our listeners can really try to get in touch with their power? Or is there anything else that you want to share about just owning your sexuality and owning your power and cultivating that confidence in your business? I honestly just feel like, you know, taking the small steps to learn to trust yourself um, is really just how you tap into pleasure. So just doing one thing, you know, every single day that brings you more pleasure, you know, um, for me, you know, one of the things that my friends always judge me about is I'm not really big into cooking. Like what brings me pleasure is having my food prepared for me and brought to me. And so I am a restaurant and a takeout queen without apology. I don't care how much it costs me per month. It's just something that I work extra for so that I can have that experience. It brings me pleasure. You know, and so give yourself permission, whatever it is, even if it's that small thing of, you know what, I'm going to go and eat at the restaurant today, you know, or I'm going to get these really amazing sheets, you know, on my bed or like a, a foam, you know, mattress topper so that when I sleep, like I sleep well, you know, or I'm going to, you know, buy myself a new dress, you know, that uh, just gives me, you know, this feeling of, uh, goddess or opulence or you know whatever it is that rocks your boat like go do that so i think it's just those small kind of incremental steps like just one thing every day that you can do to bring yourself more pleasure i think that's kind of the mindset that i like to give 
the women that I work with, regardless of whether they're like a client in my marketing agency, you know, or whether they're attending one of my workshops, like that for me is, is the key. So yeah, one day at a time. I love that. And you know, the thing with even, um, getting takeout or eating in a restaurant, that could be something that you're doing kind of mindlessly and not even thinking about or noticing like, wow, this is really nice having someone bring me my food. And wow, this squeeze of lime tastes so amazing on this pad thai. And it could be something that you just mindlessly go through. Um, So from what I'm hearing from you is even just bringing awareness and attention and just noticing what's already bringing you pleasure and putting your attention on that will probably really help you bring attention to all the pleasure that you're getting out of your business and all the different aspects of your life. Absolutely. And giving yourself permission to, to actually do it, you know, and speaking, especially of the restaurant example, um, I'll never forget. I was in a relationship and, um, my ex for the life of me could not understand why I would rather go out to dinner by myself than go to his Christmas party. And I had just completed a week of finals for my, my master's. I was exhausted. And I was like, you know what? I just want someone to like wait on me and I don't feel like entertaining people right now. And so I went to this badass Italian restaurant. I put on my best dress, you know, and one of my girlfriends actually had to remind me to do this because I think that oftentimes we're in our relationships and we think that everything has to be a couple thing and like it doesn't. So I went, you know, to the restaurant, I had on my best dress. I walked in and the waiter um, was just like, are you, are you alone? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, okay. And he like sits me at the table He's like, can I order for you? And I'm like, yes, please. And he proceeds to fucking deck out like my whole meal experience, like down to like the lemoncello at the end, like amazing, amazing. And so for me, it was such a pleasurable experience. And, you know, funny enough, like I did actually make it to my ex's house, like after the party was done and after I finished my meal and I walked in glowing, like glowing. And he's like, I thought you went out to eat. And I was like, I did. And it was great. <laughs> it was awesome. And so again, just giving yourself permission to, to have those experiences regardless of what it is for you. Like that is that energy is going to carry over into all of the different parts of your life. But I've seen it, especially in your business. So yeah, cultivate your pleasure. You're going to see some returns. Right. I definitely see nothing bad coming from people cultivating a bit more joy in their everyday life for sure. I know you talking about getting dressed for the restaurant even makes me think about getting dressed for work. And this was something that I made a point to do whenever I first started working for myself. Like, I'm going to get dressed. And I think I even blogged about it. Like, you got to get dressed for yourself, people. And then (laughs) a few years in, I was not getting dressed for myself at all. And um, my business, we're starting to grow a little bit and just hired an employee. And it was a good reminder to like, oh, yeah maybe make yourself just a little bit more presentable and not just for my employee or for my team or for Emily whenever we're Skyping or for our guests, but for myself. And I think that it's just so easy to forget to show up for yourself first and foremost. Right. I'll also throw in there, sometimes I show up for myself by just wearing my PJs to work. (laughs) For sure. Like taking the time that I would have spent getting ready to do something else that I enjoy, I also find great pleasure in doing. So it can look like whatever for anyone, just give yourself permission to do it, whatever it may be. Well, I give myself permission to go buy a yoni egg. What (laughs) crystal should I get? Oh, good question. You know what? No, it's a personal, it's a personal choice. Yeah. When you get to um, yonieggs.com, like literally just look at the crystals and whatever, you know, read them, you know, see what, you know, the different properties are of the crystals and then just choose the one that resonates with you. Like there is no, um, at least from the standpoint of, you know, how we practice, like there is no like, oh, like this, you know, crystal has to be your first crystal. Like you have to start with rose quartz or you have to start with obsidian. Like, no, there's no rules. <laughs> do what is, is it, it, what attracts itself to you. So do that. Okay. So that's one. Two, I'm going to buy myself some bomb ass pajamas. Yeah. All this talk Wonderful. just made me think like I want some like nice pajamas. <laughs> that's beautiful thought, Kathleen. I love <laughs> it. I give you permission to have that thought. <laughs> 
What about you guys? What are you giving yourselves permission to do? Oh, here is a good one. I've been giving myself, this is silly. I've been giving myself permission to eat gluten fairly regularly lately as someone who's been gluten free for, um, for almost three years now for two and a half years now, like pretty ongoing, except for when we travel. Cause that's really difficult. Um, I find great pleasure in a fucking biscuit. <laughs> I'm not going to play. And I found myself resenting being gluten-free when I would see biscuits walk by me and not like a crazy, like gluttony thing, but like legit soul food for me is a biscuit. Um, so I've been giving myself permission to eat gluten guilt-free lately and I have loved it. And That's how does your body react whenever you eat it guilt-free? Do you feel like your body reacts fine to it? It's fine. It's totally it? fine. Right? Look at that. Look right? at that. So I will continue eating my biscuits. Thank you. What about you, Ariel? What, what kind of pleasure are you bringing into your life right now? Well, I just gave myself permission to buy myself all new furniture. So like after yes. literally, you know, 20 years of having like the same furniture and like doing all sorts of things to like make it into like whatever, you know, painting it and like gold leafing it, et cetera. I finally just woke up one day. I was sitting in my kitchen and I was looking at my furniture and I was like, hmm, it's time for some new furniture. And so I just went and, you know, dropped four grand. And I was like, dude, I'm getting new furniture. And <laughs> it's all here. And now I love it. So I feel like I have like, you know, a boss babe, like freaking desk now. And like, I have a, an amazing new bed. And, you know, now my apartment just has like a whole new energy into it, like to it. So I, I'm, I'm enjoying my new furniture. So, you know, just sitting on my new velvet chairs and um, those things, like little things like that bring me pleasure. And I just ordered a bunch of new house plans. So yeah, it's, it's home pleasure for me right now. Nice. Love it. All right. Where can our listeners find more about you and about the Driven Workshops? So you can find more about me. Well, one, I'm on all social media outlets. So, you know, pick your pick, your pick or whatever. But I love Instagram. So you can find me at Ariel Lauren, A-R-I-E-L-L-E-L-O-R-E-N dot um, Lauren, right? For Instagram. And then for the website, it's ariellauren.com. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. You can send me a friend request. Like as long as, you know, you look like it's pretty normal. Like I, I love just community on Facebook. So I'll probably say yes anyway. Um, and yeah, like, really just I'm pretty much like an, an open book honestly um when it comes to the driven workshops so right now they're pretty much happening on um a I guess you would say like a b2b kind of style and so if they're booked in a city near you we'll make an announcement the best thing is just to sign up for my email list because I'll be blasting like okay we're going to be in this city next that city next etc if you want to have the whole experience of you know, working with your sexual energy, working with your creative energy and seeing how that plays out in your life. Like those are the safe spaces that we've created to, to make that happen. So yeah, just really excited, really excited about life. Uh, loved having you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, this has been a blast. You two are awesome. And this has just felt like a big like girlfriend love fest. So this has been so, so pleasurable. And, you know, hats off to you ladies. I can't wait to read your book. Um, I'm sure it's going to be absolutely amazing. And um, yeah, please keep me posted on, on how we can support as well, you know, over on my side. So yeah. Of course. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much to our team and sponsors who make Being Boss possible. Our sound engineer and web developer, Corey Winter. Our editorial director and content manager, Caitlin Brain. Our community manager and social media director, Sharon Lukey. And our Bean counter, David Austin, with support from Braid Creative and Indie Shopography. Do the work. Be boss, and we'll see you next week.